Good to see everyone this morning. So I said that we would do it and we're doing it. Uh, uh, Asked that uh, anyone that had any questions uh, that they would like to put forward, that we would do our best to uh, answer those. And uh, I want to, from the onset, make a definitive statement. We are not experts in any of the fields that we are going to be uh, providing our responses to. We are students, uh, much like uh, everyone would be. Uh, I thought Eric's lesson this morning, if we could just play the the first five minutes of that lesson, uh, it would be fantastic because he orchestrated uh, amazingly uh, the uh, necessity to question. So the questions that we have uh, are completely acceptable uh, and to uh, work through, uh, reason together, and come to the conclusions uh, in our findings. So I thought that was an excellent uh, premise uh, to kind of put us into uh, the mode of a Q&A. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Jeff Hussey and Wendell Maxey uh, to come join me on stage. And we will uh, set out and begin answering uh, as, again, best that we can, the questions that have been presented. And I thought the questions uh, were uh, really excellent. And, and I also appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the use of your words in asking those questions, I thought was very uh, thoughtful uh, as well. And so uh, with that, we're going to begin, and, and I'm going to hand this over to Jeff. Uh, he has the first question. So the, let me get myself organized here. First question, could the Lord have used the Big Bang to begin creation? Um, I'm going to have to limit myself to this. Some of you may not know this, but in high school, I seriously considered uh, becoming a physicist, particle physicist. I was fascinated with that, cosmology and all that kind of stuff. I was the geek or the nerd, depending on how you want to look at it, in high school that was spending all the time in the library reading books on black holes, which were not accepted at that point and all that kind of stuff. So this is fascinating stuff to me, and I I could talk about it for hours, but I will limit myself this morning. Yes. (laughs) So uh, let's start off with the Big Bang Theory. Uh, First thing is... It has many problems. If you look at the Wikipedia entry on it, um, there is a whole section in there that that lists the various issues that the Big Bang Theory has in that that model does not explain, it cannot explain. Um, And the other thing I noticed too in looking at the Wikipedia article, and I quote, uh, the Big Bang Theory has multiple cosmological models that explain the evolution of the observable universe from the earliest known periods through its subsequent large-scale form. Uh, so there's, it has a lot of issues. There's various models. Uh, there's not just one model of the Big Bang Theory. Um, further, if you um, go a little bit further into it, um, it, it you, you go back and look at what spawned the Big Bang Theory, and it was astronomer, astronomers observing that everything in the universe was moving away from everything else in the universe. So they went back and said, what could cause this? And that's where the Big Bang originated. Um, There's some problems with that observation even, and in the Wikipedia article it also mentions that many astronomers refer to that as a Doppler effect. Um, And it's kind of the same thing, the Doppler effect, if you're not familiar with that, is the same thing when you hear a train blowing its horn coming towards you and then as it passes by you hear that shift, the the shift in the tone, right? Everybody's familiar with that. That's the Doppler effect, except they look at it with, in looking at all the objects in the universe, they look at it uh, through light waves. Same shift happens there. If it's moving away from you, it's a red shift. If it's moving towards you, it's a blue shift. So the problem with that is the observation and the article, the Wikipedia article alludes to this, is that you can't just call it the Doppler effect. The astronomical model is a modified Doppler effect, if you will, because some of the objects that we observe moving away from us 
the further away they are, the faster they're moving, and some of those objects, by a strict Doppler interpretation, are moving faster than the speed of light, which is not possible. So there's all sorts of problems with the Big Bang Theory. Um, one of the fundamental things that we have to consider with the Big Bang Theory, though, when we're talking about creation, is that the Big Bang Theory, the, the basis of that model, is what I call chaos theory. Um, and that is, it is a model that order comes from chaos. That is the same concept around the evolution, uh, cross-species evolution is chaos to order. Um, the Bible and the account of creation in Genesis that we have is not chaos to order, it is design, it is intent. So the two concepts are incompatible. There's no way for you to look at the Big Bang and accept it or try to incorporate it into the creation model. For the first part, one of the things that the Big Bang Theory cannot, does not explain is how the Big Bang happened. So there, the Big Bang Theory does not take into account or take into consideration where the huge mass of, uh, or the huge collection of mass came from or what started it, what triggered it. Stephen Hawking, one of the famous uh, physicists and scientists, once made a statement that the Big Bang Theory, if nothing else, helps prove the existence of God because that would, that would help explain how the Big Bang formed and got started. My question for Stephen Hawking and people who, who might believe this is if you believe there is a God, why can't you believe in his word and what he says in the Bible and accept that? So, bottom line for the Big Bang Theory, and, and again, we could go in and talk about where does the Big Bang Theory fit in creation? How did, in the very first verses in Genesis chapter one, verse one, talk about the void that, that existed, the void, the waterless, the, the water that existed, and it was formless, it was empty, but there was water there. So where would that fit in the Big Bang Theory? It can't be before the Big Bang because where'd the water come from? It can't be after it because I have a feeling that if the Big Bang were real and that explosion, the, you're not gonna have calmness, you're not gonna have emptiness, you're not gonna have this water that you, that you can float over, that the Spirit of God floated over. That wouldn't exist. So there's no way for that. Bottom line is the two, the two concepts are incompatible. The, there's no room in the creation account for the Big Bang Theory, just as there's no room in the Big Bang Theory for the creation account. They are incompatible. So bottom line is you have to pick one to believe in. That's the bottom line. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Wendell, you've got the, the next question. Okay. If you guys can hear me okay. This next question was really one that I've probably have asked myself, you know, I don't know how many times, you know, uh, were the ages recorded in the Old Testament literal? 969 years old? Are you, are you kidding me? 777 years old? You know, um, 500 years old before you even have your first, you know, your three sons? Uh, you know, 600, you know, years old? You know, all those dates, you know, really, uh, I think as you're growing up and, and even trying to study and to become a student of the Bible kind of seem uh, maybe un unreal to you. I found real quickly, you know, that if I didn't understand pre-flood and the conditions of the earth and the environment versus post-flood, that that presented a big uh, part of the equation, you know, or the or the... Uh, the problem that I was trying to reason in my own mind, you know, as far as literal ages. It also would come to me, and I would think to myself, you know, well, I'm a firm believer it's six literal days, you know, that God created, you know, the earth, man, and rested on that seventh day. You know, if those are literal days, you know, why aren't the dates, you know, given to us by Moses of the, the Old Testament patriarchs? You know, why is that not the case? The chart that we have here, age of the earth, creation to the flood, it's just simply a, a representation to show 
you know, the, the birth, you know, of these patriarchs, you know, as it, as it started, uh, their ages, uh, how things could, you know, progress. Uh, and for me, like I said, I think really the, the answer there was pre-flood understanding of the earth and the conditions versus, you know, post-flood. Uh, you know, how vegetation, as we talked about in some of our lessons, you know, was huge and, and uh, dinosaurs, you know, and the longevity of not just man, you know, but some of the animals, you know, uh, how long, you know, uh, they would live. Um, and you know what? It was in God's uh, plan, I mean, you know, to populate the earth. You know, how well are we going to populate the earth, you know, if the lifespan is 75, 80 years old? You know, if it's that five, six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred, then we probably got a lot better chance of, you know, populating uh, the earth. Um, you know, very specific. This is what I like about Genesis. We talked about it's a study of truth. You know, very specific. God, you know, to Moses as he's writing it, recording it, Genesis 7, 11 through 12, you know, pick up the specificity, you know, in, in the scripture. You know, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day, of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Why so specific? 40 days and 40 nights. Why not just say, and rain fell for a period of time? You know, very specific. You know, uh, down to the point of the day and the month, you know, in Noah's uh, time, you know, of when the flood started. You know, very specific uh, times. Are those dates, uh, those years, those ages literal? I firmly believe so, they are. Uh, and we will see uh, in a similar question that's coming up, uh, what changed? What changed that? You know, Methuselah, you know, 969, you know, all the way down to, you know, Abraham as recorded, you know, 175 years old, something cataclysmic changed to alter that uh, difference in lifespan, you know, on the earth. And we'll talk about that. Uh, in just a little bit uh, later. So I'm going to show this one just real quickly, uh, just to simply to say, you know, as far as the, the ages, you know, uh, again, Adam, you know, Seth, you know, those, you know, the ages. And then we'll talk about in our, our next question a little bit later, you know, what that cataclysmic event was. And then we see, obviously, the change, drastic change in ages uh, to come up. So literal, yes. Uh, I'm a firm believer uh, that it is. I don't believe there's uh, any doubt uh, that those are just ages or, or, uh, of, of patriarchs that are just, you know, given as, uh, oops, wrong way, given for uh, no other reason, you know, just uh, but why wouldn't they be literal? <laughs> I guess that's what I, the only thing I can think of. Why wouldn't they be literal? What else could they be if they weren't literal? So great question, great question. So this next question is for uh, Jeff by drawing of the short straw. <clears throat> so again, I love studying man's theories and I spend a lot of time, I've spent a lot of time on uh, uh, the climate change uh, information and the data that's out there and all the reports. And my approach to it is always one of openness and that is, I always approach something and say, you know, all right, let's, let's start from square zero, and, and I want this article or this theory or whatever it is to convince me that it is correct. Um, so far, I've been disappointed. Uh, but let's, uh, let's get into this. So if it is, is it fair to say that based on the Bible, man-made climate change doesn't exist? So let me start off, and this is tricky, so bear with me here a little bit. Let me start off by saying climate change is real. There is no question about climate change. If you go back and look in the uh, 1800s, uh, there are accounts and reports and even some drawings of uh, the River Thames in England freezing solid during the winter months. Solid enough that they had activities and carnivals and things like that out on the middle of the river on that ice. It was that thick, that solid. That has not happened in quite some time. So climate change is for real. It, it, it is going on. Um, what's causing that is up for considerable debate. Um, according to a lot of people out there, man is responsible for this. Um, one of the things that I have in, in my studies of it and looking at all this, one of the things that comes 
forward very quickly is the fact that a lot of what the earth goes through the, is cyclical. There's a lot of changes. Uh, a hole in the ozone layer that was a big debate back in the 80s has opened and closed a couple of times since the 80s. Uh, there's all sorts of evidence of cycles. We live in cycles every year. We go through the seasons. We go through, you know, spring, summer, win fall, winter. I skipped fall because we really don't have fall in Texas, but, um, you know, it's very cyclical. What causes climate change? Depending on who you talk to, it's man. He's responsible for it. However, the data doesn't really support that. And just like with the Big Bang Theory, a lot of the climate, the man-made climate change theories have a lot of problems. They have a lot of issues and they can't explain a lot of things. Uh, again, if we had, if you wanna go and have a long lunch sometime, I'll be glad to sit down and talk in detail with a lot of these models uh, and talk about it. One of the big problems I have with some of the stuff that's being presented with, as, as science and your experts today is the very concept of science itself. Science, the true science, it, it invites questions to theories. In fact, it demands questions of theories. So if you have someone that is presenting a theory and you question that theory and they get defensive and arrogant and start calling you names, uh, that's a red flag. That is a red flag. That should not be the case. And that makes me question those people. If they're not inviting the questions and they're not humbly accepting those questions and, and, and presenting their facts in a civilized manner, not like a bunch of kids on a playground, uh, then I, I, that's a red flag and we need to be wary of that. So I won't go into any more on that. What's our position as Christians as far as climate change is concerned? Um, the Bible tells us that seasons will continue until the earth ends, Genesis 8, 22. Uh, the Bible also tells us that when the earth ends, God will do it. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 7, and 10, those verses specifically describe what will happen when the world is destroyed and who will be doing that. It's not going to be man. Man's not going to destroy the, the world. God will. Just like he did with flood before, he'll do it with fire the second time. So how are we to respond to this? I, in my mind, the Bible has a singular intent, and that is to tell the story of God's love for man and how man can have a relationship with God, God man's salvation. That is the intent of the Bible. We have to be very careful as Christians not to attempt to repurpose the Bible as a weapon to counter other things. We've talked in our classes before about how if there's science in the Bible, it is accurate. If there's history in the Bible, it is accurate. But the Bible is not a science book. It is not a history book. It is not intended to be a weapon to be used to counteract theories like the Big Bang or uh, man-made climate change. That is not its intent, and we need to be careful about that, that we don't try to make it that. Um, I will say we are stewards of God's creation. The earth was created for us. The earth was created for us. It was given to us, and it was given to us to take care of. And so we should be responsible stewards for it. We should take care of things. I'm a whole lot more concerned about the huge collection of plastic bottles and now masks that are floating in the ocean and various spots in the ocean. Uh, I'm more concerned about that than I am climate change because that's irresponsibility. That's something that we can do. So as Christians, individually, let's do what we can to take care of our environment, you know, and that's, that's as far as you could go. As far as climate change is concerned, I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it at all because God's in control. This is God's creation. He's in control, and that is not something I spend time worrying about is climate change, and that's what we should do. We should be focused on our mission, which is to seek and save the lost. Thank you, Jeff. So I think that last 
uh, part is very important and critical for us in the church uh, to understand. And that is, uh, you know, I remember Eric's, one of his first lessons was talking about someone is, is indoctrinating your children. And that we should indoctrinate our children with God's word. And when you see indoctrination occurring that is outside of God's word and in direct contrast, uh, if, if you're being told that, that man is going to destroy the world, that is an exact indoctrination against what God has said, as Jeff pointed out with after the flood, that the earth will remain summer, winter, seed time and harvest. You know, you see this uh, phenomenal snow falling in, in uh, New York. And I think, what is it, 80 inches? Uh, if you go back into 1960, I believe, there was 100 inches of snow that fell. So, uh, you know, people yesterday were pointing to that as, see, we're destroying the world. That's just indoctrination. And we need to be very aware of that and very cautious of that, that uh, we don't fall prey to that. I can't imagine having a child that can't sleep at night, as I've read and seen, because they're concerned about the uh, man-made climate change destroying this world. I can't imagine being someone that goes to sleep at night uh, concerned that that's how, that should be top of my mind. God, God answered that question for us all the way back in Genesis. He, he, he answered it. And if you believe in God's word, then you should sleep very soundly uh, over such questions. So appreciate but that response. Go just ahead. one quick thing I'll point out. There was a book that a, a, a guy published, I think it was a scientist, published several years ago um, that was, I think the title of it was called, So You Want to Destroy the World. And it's a little, it's satirical, but it basically is, it's, it's, a, it's a book on talking about how difficult it would actually be to destroy the world. And, and I find, in going through it, uh, reading some excerpts of it and everything, I found it comforting to read that book and realize just how difficult it would be for a man if he wanted to destroy the world, how difficult it would actually be to do. All right, next question. Can you explain how all of the various ocean waters resulted in high salinity versus fresh from the global flood? And so I think uh, I'll, I'll take that to paraphrase. If the water completely covered the earth above all of the highest mountains, then obviously all of the water in essence would be mixed. So how would you get oceans that have the saltiness and you would have uh, in, from this question's inference, you have fresh water that is not salty, uh, but that's a premise that is, you know, we would have to clarify because all water has salinity. All water uh, has salt content. If you live in College Station, all you need is a dime's worth of shampoo, I can assure you, to wash your hair. And it'll take you quite a long time to get it out. And it feels like it's still there when you're drying off. If you did the same here in Round Rock, you have to put a whole palmful in there just to get a little bit of lather going because of the different salinity levels that are in that water. So let's, let's just keep that real, that there is salinity everywhere in all water systems, there is salinity. So the question then becomes, well, what makes the ocean that much more uh, higher content of salinity and salt than uh, most fresh waters that we see? So the thing that you'll see here is that there are salty lakes in the world all over the place. And some of them have uh, as high and two higher than the ocean salt water content. So again, the question doesn't become so much, well, why is the ocean water so salty contrasted against freshwater sources? The question is, how does water become salinified? How does salt introduce into the water. You have these little rivers. You see all that white going along that river? That's salt. You ever been out on a boat in fresh water and water has splashed up onto your boat and as it dries, you end up with a little film there 
You know what that little film is? That's, that's salinity. That's some salt. You go do that in the ocean and you don't clean that boat, you know what you get? You get rust because of the salt content. You ever seen those movies where they're out and it's freezing and the salt is literally freezing to them because it freezes faster. That's why you put salt in your ice cream uh, makers is because of that. So salt exists everywhere. And it's just the, you know, what causes the degree of salinity? That's really the question. And NASA uh, has a salinity chart, believe it or not. Uh, they, uh, it was, uh, I think, about 10 years ago, they finally uh, had the buoys in place and were able to measure the salt content, uh, the salinity, I think is the better uh, use of a word, in the oceans. And if you notice this, what you're going to see is that the oceans are not all have the same salinity even within its own body of water. It's not homogenous anywhere. You have different degrees of salinity. Well, what would cause that? Well, evaporation is the key component to salinity levels. And that's why if you have something with salt water and you allow it to dry, you end up with, we had on that previous slide, a salt residue. Well, in the ocean, as you have that evaporation going and then it falls back down into the ocean, it is a higher salinity level than what was present because of the drying uh, forces of that and how the evaporation occurs and what is added in the atmosphere to that water when it comes back down. So that is the number one cause of salinity change that you'll see in uh, the world's waters. Uh, you also have volcanic activity. We know that there's active volcanoes under the ocean, even today. Uh, we have volcanoes that are around freshwater that it creates a higher salinity level uh, when they pour into that. Uh, you have outflows from icebergs uh, that will, and glaciers that will impact the salinity levels. And of course, the rivers and streams that are feeding into the ocean are also going to have uh, deposits of salt that are introduced into the ocean. So that's very important to put. I put this slide here because that's, that's uh, some fish. Uh, over 95% of all of the fossils are marine creatures. Uh, they died and are fossilized by the trillions, it's estimated, and are buried in fossil graveyards, tightly packed together, choked with sediments, buried before they had time to decay. Obviously, they didn't live in the environments in which they are now encapsulated. Uh, they were transported by rapidly moving water and then buried in sedimentary deposits. But how could, any, how could current fish survive in a uh, freshwater fish in the ocean if at one time all of those waters were connected? Well, I would point you just back to that, number one, and the fact that there is no fixed salinity level that was, a, that was present. There was no fixed salinity level. Uh, and so, in fact... It would, by nature, as scientific will show, salinity levels would be much lower in the past. And something Dad and I were talking about was if you go and you're studying um, the salinity models now, uh, you'll see that, um, oh, I just blinked out. What, what did we talk about? We were just talking. It was a good point. That's it. At, at the rate of salinity level, thank you, at the rate of the salinity rising each year in the ocean, if you take that rate and you extrapolate backwards, then the ocean would have had, you know, had to have negative salinity because any salinity present at the Big Bang, if we were to allow them their theory, the salinity that would have occurred by now due to that cycle of evaporation, due to sedimentary exposure of runoff, everything, you would have an ocean that is so salty that no life, it would be the Dead Sea times 10, as I like to put it. So no, that, that model fails under that microscope. You have uralene fish that we are aware of, fish that can swim both in salt water and live in fresh water. So you have everything from salmon, and it's interesting that salmon begins in freshwater, doesn't it? It begins in a freshwater environment, and then it swims 
downstream into the oceans and becomes saltwater capable. Well, what is that? Well, is that adaptability? Well, yes, that's adaptability. So by that study in nature, obviously fish could have adapted to their environment over a period of time, especially if the salinity levels had increased over time, they naturally would be able to adapt to that salinity level. Uh, you have uh, the Amazon, that white one there with a toucan looking over it. That's an Amazon river dolphin. So that dolphin comes from the ocean and it could swim up into the river without any problem at all. And you have a multitude other that are demonstrated here, the bull shark. So if you're swimming in fresh water in, in certain areas and you think, well, at least I don't have sharks, think again. Uh, so you, you can have a bull shark in there. You have herring, you have white perch, uh, many others that can live, coexist in fresh and salt water. And I find that extremely fascinating in terms of what we've discussed in terms of adaption to environment uh, through genetics and things of that nature. Additionally, studies have shown that waters of various temperatures, uh, chemistries and sediment loads do not tend to mix. Uh, I have a lake uh, on a piece of property and my neighbor asked and they dug a large uh, pit next to where my lake goes in and I probably should have said no because now my lake is down and it won't come back up because it keeps filling his pit. But now his pit is full. And with the recent rains, you would think, well, I'm gonna have a muddy lake because his pit was made, dug out in the mud. But if you, I meant to get a picture of it, if you look at it, you know what you have? You have a muddy pit full of water and you have the rest of the lake because of the weight of the sediments in there has not overflowed into the rest of the lake. So you can have that in the oceans as well. In fact, you do have that in parts of the ocean. That's why NASA has that study and showing that it is not homogenous in there. Uh, the pre-flood oceans were likely somewhat salty, uh, obviously not as salty as now. This statement, we're seeing big changes in ocean salinities that can only be explained by an increase in the water cycle. And this is a, a scientist uh, with NASA. We see the changing salinity and we want to relate it to the changing water cycle, but we have to understand what the ocean is doing. Well, what the ocean is doing is what God purposed the ocean to do. And that's why life in the ocean exists and will always exist until the end of time. I'm gonna skip uh, due to time, uh, skip these, uh, talking water salinity of looking at uh, Antarctica and some of the ice uh, where fresh water comes from. Let's see if there's anything I'd want to pull out of there. Nah, let's leave it at that. All right, we'll go to the next question. Uh, that is you. Okay. All right, Wendell. Okay, so next question uh, was a little similar to the one uh, a little earlier. The question was, you mentioned that the dates we find recorded in Genesis uh, can be used to give an approximate age of the earth and therefore the universe. Please comment on this. Another, another great question you know, about that topic. You know, using that similar slide uh, as earlier, you know, the age of the earth, you know, that was mentioned uh, it's a, a really good question to, to understand, you know, the exact, uh, and, and the, the question has been, and still today in circles, is, is amazing. You know, you will hear as well as I will hear all the time, you know, theories, hypothesis, taught as fact, uh, we're two billion years old, we're a hundred million years old, you know, this earth, I mean, the just look any place you want to and you'll usually get a different answer, you know, or, or theory, you know, and my thinking is, is that, you know, what, what does the Bible say, you know, about that? You know, uh, we saw the, the ages of, of the patriarchs, you know, how long they lived, you know, how old, you know, is this earth? I mean, that's a really good question. You know, who wouldn't have that uh, question, you know, or wonder uh, about that? Um, it comes to go here really next. I like to do it, and, and Randy sent this, and this was really good, you know, it just, let's just do some math. 
Let's talk a little bit for a second and do some math. So I'm going to go through this here with you, uh, if you'll follow me. So the link up, you know, how old is the earth? You know, there's our question. How can we go from our time back, you know, to then? We can fix dates in the Old Testament history with virtual certainty now by way of several means. Dates back to 900, uh, excuse me, 891 B.C., the most publicized date for the division of the kingdom under Rehoboam and Jeroboam was the date given by Usher, uh, incorporated in the margins of many Bibles during the past century, 990 to 953 B.C. But this has since been proven to be incorrect. A lot of Bible margins, you may still see that. Then many scholars thought they could pinpoint the division of the kingdom within the years 937 to 922 B.C. You will still find that date uh, in many older uh, books on Old Testament history. But the date adopted universally, and for good reason, is 931 to 930 B.C. How do we know this is correct? And it's important. In the book, The World of the Old Testament, by Packer, Tenney and White, we read... The Sumerians kept very careful records of legal decisions, contracts, and commercial dealings. So their clay tablets give us a full and exact picture of their daily life. The Babylonians and Assyrians studied the movement of the stars, and they used what they learned to make a very precise calendar. So now we can figure the time of many events in Sumo-Babylonian history almost to the day and to the hour. Ancient Assyrian writings clearly cataloged King Jehu of Israel and King Ahab of Israel uh, and other such links in connection with their historical data link with the position of the stars. So we can check their dates with the movements of the stars, which our present knowledge enables us to plot accurately. The Assyrian leaders, uh, Berg Sagal, governor of Guzana, uh, was in his first year of office when an eclipse of the sun occurred. Astronomers tell us that absolutely, that could only have been on June 15th, 753 BC. That event and date corroborates other date link-ups through uh, astronomical data. Therefore, we can use that date, among others, to establish the dates of other Assyrian leaders that are mentioned in order in the list. And those years of office are neatly arranged. They really are, really neatly arranged. Though these, through these lists, Hebrew kings are listed and thus dated. And the Bible accounts exactly coincides with the Hebrew kings making contact with those very Assyrian leaders. Therefore, the connection is solid. A very simplistic definition given above, but quite adequate for us now to see the point. The division of the kingdom in Israel took place in 931 or 930 B.C., the same year Solomon died. So we have our number from Christ backwards, 931 years. Now let's follow the link up uh, from the beginning to that date. So I want to do just a little bit of math here, uh, if you guys can see this chart. Um, so we are taking, as we know, Abraham, you know, being born, uh, 1948 B.C. With that, we're going to add, we know from, from biblical account, Abraham, 100 years old when Isaac was born. Okay, what date does that bring us to? 2048. Doing the math, follow me here, 60 years. Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born. We know that. There are 60 years. That brings us up to, if you can see my line 7 there, uh, 2108 B.C. The Bible tells us Jacob entered Egypt to join Joseph when he was 130 years old. There's 130. 2108 plus 130, we get 2238. So we're up to 2238. 430 years from day entered Egypt until Exodus. We're told that, 430 years. 
2,238 plus 430, we're now up to line 11 there, 2,668. There's our date. Bible tells us 480 years from when Exodus, uh, from Egypt to building of temple in the fourth year of, of Solomon's reign. We're given that time span. 2,668. Do the math here with me, 480 added to that. We're up to line 13, 3,148 B.C. Solomon reigned 36 more years, so that's a total of 40 in all until death and the divided kingdom. We're going to add 40 to that, 3,148 B.C. plus 40 more years. We're at 3,184 B.C. Since the division of the kingdom came in 3184 BC years after creation and since that was the year and since that was the year 931 BC up what we referenced in point A above then creation took place in 44115 BC doing the math backwards from the cre from creation to Christ 4115 years, give or take four years on the basis of calendar reconciliation. We're going to add how many years it has been from our present day in 2022 to 4115 BC, and that is the approximately how old the earth is. Now, I'll say approximate, okay, but I want you to see millions, billions, millions, billions? No. We can definitely rule that out uh, without a doubt, those hypotheses. More likely, at 4,115 uh, 4, B.C., we're in the year 2022, our current A.D. Let's just add those two together. 4,115, we're adding 2,022 uh, years to that. Gives us a total of 6,137 years, approximately. I say approximately because the number's not 2 million. The number's not 4 million. The number's not when an asteroid decided to hit the Earth 10 million years ago. It's not that at all. It's approximately 6,600 6, you know, years old. From biblical account where we match that you know, with other literature you know, dating back. You know, someone who tells us you know, the Earth is you know, 400 million years old, you know, I mean, that is a complete, where are you... What a leap of faith, you know, to try to get to that number, you know, if we're just simply taking recorded events in the Bible that align, you know, with other uh, extra biblical, you know, literature where we can line up the, the, something that was kept very well, the reigns of the kings, you know, and, and not even in Israel, but in other uh, kingdoms as well, you know, start and ending of those kingdoms, you know, and that information is available and how it lines up, you know, with the Bible. How old is the, uh, you mentioned, you know, how old is the end of the uh, approximate age of the earth? I would submit to you 6,100, you know, plus years old uh, in that range, not, not 3 million. So Great let, question. Let me, let me add on to that and blow your mind a little bit more. Um, given the account of creation, that is also the age of the universe because the earth was created before the rest of the universe was created. Thank you, Wendell. So, uh, in looking at this, and by the way, uh, all of those uh, ages that are mentioned there, uh, we can provide you with the, the scripture. Uh, it's actually in the notes, I see. You have every single verse there. We'll, we'll throw that up there uh, in the future, but you can go back and you can look and you can do that math uh, for yourself from the beginning all the way up until uh, the Solomon you, it is given in the Bible. It is given, given in Scripture uh, so that you can map that out to see the ages and how they line up. Uh, so what, what changed that makes the 2 billion years or 10 billion year old universe uh, what we have today on this earth? And we all know what happened. There was a cataclysmic flood that completely destroyed everything on this earth. Uh, one of the other questions that was in tandem to this was why... Do uh, things look so old? <clears throat> and not talking about you, yeah. uh, some of you, but dad. But why, are, why, are, why, why do things look so aged and old? Well, uh, 
you know, there was a cataclysmic flood. And, and we also know that when things were created, they were created full grown, weren't they? Everything was created full grown. Well, how, how old did, did Adam look? How old did a tree look? How old did the plants look? How old did the earth look, right? It was created fully grown. And then you add on to that the destructive force of a global cataclysmic flood and all that we read that went on in that. And you look at an aftermath of a flood today and take a look at how aged some things look in the aftermath of that. So I wanna thank uh, Jeff and Wendell uh, for taking the time to put their responses together. I wanna thank the uh, members for putting those questions forward. Uh, I think they were excellent questions and ones that, that uh, should be addressed. Uh, and we're certainly not shy to do so. Uh, thank you for your time.